is my first session of Journal Through It, and this is a joint project between Ardith Goodwin and myself. You met Ardith yesterday online, and she shared a wonderful video about her tools and her books and her process. And today I'm essentially going to do the same thing. So I'm um, going to ask that you bear with us, bear with me in particular. I am clearly, I'm here in my kitchen this morning. I have a quiet household for the moment. We'll see how long that lasts. Um, uh, but that, that seems to be the nature of everybody's lives right now is just um, rolling with the punches. So here we go, right? Um, journaling, art journaling in particular, uh, it has been a tool that I've used for pro over 15 years. Um, I really can't recall the exact date when I started journaling, but it all happened at a point in time when I was looking for a way to be uh, to be creative and make things just for myself. Um, I'm a working artist, so I make my money or my or earn my keep, I suppose, by painting commission portraits um, for other people. And at the time that I began journaling, I was doing daily pet portraits commissioned, and. I, I just really needed to figure out a way to fall back in love with my paints and my materials and remind myself why I fell in love with them to begin with. And I came across this book by Dawn Sokol, and I hope I'm saying her name right. It's S-O-K-O-L. And the book is called A Thousand Artist Journal Pages. And I can't remember, I should have looked up when the book was published. Uh, but anyway, I, I got this book, it was full of eye candy, and it was all these journal pages from artists who had been art journaling for years, and I'd never heard of it before. So I began to go down the rabbit hole of journaling and Googling and, and looking at websites and finding online classes, and um, completely and totally fell, fell head over heels in love with the process. So. Um, you know, there, there's really two basic rules of journaling. Um, the first rule is that there are no rules. Uh, anything goes. It's your book. It's your space. It's your practice. You get to decide what's right and what's wrong. And really, there is no wrong in journaling, which is the second rule. Um, the second rule is that you have to give yourself permission. You have to give yourself permission to dive in wholeheartedly with zero expectations and just accept what you end up with. Um, nothing in your journal is permanent. Pages can be ripped out, painted over, cut up for collage, uh, or, the, or they can be closed up in a book and put on the shelf and never looked at again. You, you are entirely in control of this. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why I embraced the concept so thoroughly was because it was a space where I was completely in control. Um, and, and there's so few safe zones like that in the world. So um, that said, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the successful things that you can do when you're starting a journal practice. Um, just like when you're starting any sort of new habit, you want to make sure that you have the tools easily accessible. Because if you have to spend a half hour gathering things and setting up, um, it, it, it's not going to happen, right? We all know that. So if our gym bag is packed and it's hanging at the door right next to our car keys, it's a lot easier for us to get the motivation to go out to the gym, assuming said gym is open. Um, so I have a little pencil case of, um, this is my journal survival kit. When I find that I'm going to be going somewhere where I might be sitting in the car, you know, traveling like road tripping, or a place where I'm going to be a spectator for a bit, uh, I, I like to bring my journal along. And I can, it's just as simple as grabbing one of my books and my pencil case here that's full of my favorite journal go tos. So I'm going to share some of those with you. Ah! Um, so you really don't need any fancy tools for journaling. That's the very first thing that I want to instill in all of you. Journaling can be done with a ballpoint pen or a pencil 
and a plain notebook. You really don't need anything fancy. But as you begin to work, you're going to find that there are certain materials that just feel more natural or, or uh, they just feel right in your hand. And those are the sorts of feelings that you want to pay attention to and, and maybe stash another one of those tools in a journal survival book in a journal survival kit, ah, I can't even talk, so that you you have them on hand as well. So I'm just going to share a couple of things that I have here. Um, pencils. I love, I love pencils. There's all different kinds of pencils. Um, there are pencils that have different hardnesses of leads. Typically we use, or we're very familiar with a number two pencil from the Scantron tests. Uh, from, I'm dating myself, but you know, those little Scantron tests when we were kids. Um, but you can also get pencils in different hardnesses or softnesses, and that's going to control whether they make a light or a dark line. Um, you can also get pencils in all sorts of fun colors, I'm all about choosing things that make you smile, um, and different shapes. So, this is a pencil that I really love, and I think I should also preface. The rest of this presentation by saying I'm not affiliated with anyone. I don't get any kickbacks from mentioning any products. Um, these are just things that I genuinely love. So um, this is this is a pencil that happens to have little grippy nubbins on it, and it's triangular. So um, sometimes that that round barrel can be harder to hold. But I just, I love the texture, the, the tactile quality of holding this particular pencil. Um, it, and I can grip down on it and my fingers won't slide and I can get some nice lines with it. So this is just a little graphite with nubby texture. The other type of pencil that I love to use are mechanical pencils because they're always sharp. Uh, they don't ever have, have to be sharpened. And... Um, they're, they're, they make a consistent line all the time. That lead doesn't change. So I really enjoy working with mechanical pencils. I love, love me a gel pen. And I love that I can get them now in all, all sorts, ah, get you back on camera, all sorts of different colors. So whenever I see gel pens at the grocery store or whatever, or back to school time, I always load up on a couple of them because I go through them pretty quickly. Um, well, let's see. Here's some. I also really love a ballpoint pen that has a um, smooth, zero friction when I write. And that's probably because I like the gel pens. I prefer that nice smooth surface. So uh, when I come across pens that I really like that uh, don't seem to, to uh, create any friction on the surface of the paper, I, I throw them in my bag. And then I have a couple of other things that I absolutely love. These are, these are gel pens, but they're opaque. So the ink is really nice and thick. It's, in some cases it's raised, but I can put this over a dark page or over a magazine page that has dark ink on it, um, and my marks really stand out. So um, I love these sorts of pens. These are souffle pens, and they're made by Sakura. Um, glue stick, because you never know when you're going to find something cool like a ticket stub or a receipt or a tag that you want to glue into your book. Sharpies. Sharpies are great and they come in different colors, different tips. Um, this is just a fine point Sharpie. Um, but they And they also write on almost any surface, which is additionally an ideal. Um, these are paint pens. They're full of acrylic paints. The, this line, um, I think it's called or pronounced Pasca. But you can get them in different colors. I think some art stores or um, art like Joann's or is that called a hobby store? Joann's Michaels. Um, I think they now sell these in the singular. So you can go into the store and you can buy them based on color and what sort of a nib you like. 
Uh, these also are very opaque and they are wonderful for going over top of magazine pages. I just have a couple of the color, my favorite colors. Um, I have a gold, a gold paint pen because, come on, gold, glitter, you gotta love that. Um, this is a chalk pencil. It is white. Uh, because it is chalk, it will brush off of the page, but I just really, I love the delicate sort of line that I can get with this, and if I seal it behind some sort of, um, like Elmer's glue or something that dries clear, then, then that line gets stayed, or gets, what's the word I'm looking for? The line is preserved. Um, this is a fabulous little graphite stick and it's called a, a lira graphite and this is just a huge pencil in almost like a child size jumbo crayon size um, but the beautiful thing about this is that it's water soluble so i can draw with this and then hit it with water later on and it moves um, and i love that I love that a lot. So I have one of these in my uh, journal survival kit, along with erasers, some little binder clips, because you never know if you might need to clip your book pages down if it's windy outside or whatever. And I have, look at that, I have unicorn hand sanitizer, complete with glitter, because we particularly need this in today's world. So, I mean, your journal survival kit is going to be full of all of the things that feel good in your hands and the things that make you happy when you sit in front of your pages. Um, and I use all sorts of other materials when I'm journaling at home or in my studio, but those are, those are my go-tos um, that help me get my pages started. So, uh, you know, again, just gather your tools. If you don't have a survival kit, then designate a spot. Give yourself a shoebox, um, throw all your things in there so that when the urge hits, you can grab that box, you can go sit outside with your notebook, or you can come to the kitchen table, or sit on the couch when uh, kids are watching TV or whatever. It's always right there at hand. So um, now I want to talk about the sorts of books that I use. Uh, if you saw the post that I shared on Facebook yesterday, I had this large stack of, of journals and what I did was I went through all the books that I've used over the last 15 years and um, started to pile them and page through them as I was thinking about building the content for this experience and I was shocked at how many books I had to begin with. Um, what I showed, took a photograph of was only a few. Um, but really what I found out was that they fell, they fell into four distinct categories. So I journal with regular notebooks, with sketchbooks or um, books that are prepared or created for artists to use. Uh, I journal or make handmade books and I repurpose and alter books for journals. So I wanted to show you a few of these. Um, trying to think of the best way to do this. Well, first of all, when, when it goes to notebooks, you're very familiar with these composition books. We've been using them for years. They're about a dollar at the store. Um, you can order them on Amazon and get them delivered in three months. Uh -huh. uh, but if you order them on Amazon, you can get them with blank pages, gridded pages, uh, as well as a variety of different lined pages. I just pick mine up at the grocery store when they're on sale back to school they're 50 cents each and I get a good a good stash of them but this is a composition book and let me show you the in inside of it that has not been touched yet this is a composition book that has acrylic paint and some stickers on the top of it so uh, comp notebooks are a really wonderful, easy, affordable space to journal in. Um, actually, let me make a space here 
to stack these up and I will put you down and I'll just show you some of the pages in these before I go on to sketchbooks so that you can get an idea of the sorts of things that I do inside these notebooks. Now this is notebook paper so once you get it wet it is going to wrinkle. Can you see? Oh, maybe you can't see. I'll bring this one in closer. So you can see that the pages have a little bit of a wrinkly texture to them and that's the nature of the pages getting wet. Uh, but this is acrylic paint with gel pen. And this is an exercise again done with, with acrylic paint. So even though the pages aren't perfect and they don't accept the paint uh, like a heavier, a heavier bodied paper might, the ease of these books, the size of them is such um, that I can tuck them in my handbag whenever I'm going anywhere. And the fact that they're not precious makes them super easy for me to work in. Uh, I, I just really love them. This was an exercise where I was building or using tissue paper to explore different functional or di different design strategies. So this is just tissue paper that's glued down on the pages. This is another composition notebook. Um, ironically enough, this is the book. I um, carry one of these with me all the time and use them for my personal learning experiences as well as like when I attend meetings and things that might involve taking notes. Um, this is my composition notebook from the very first class I took with the amazing Ardith Goodwin. Um, I think I started studying with her in maybe 2016, 2017. Um, these are uh, move over here. drawings that I did in a darkened auditorium at a dance competition. Yeah. There is uh, my daughter's sticker for her, from her audition. And these are some more drawings that I did. Gel pen, just sitting there in the audience. Um, yeah, look, here's notes from a class with Ardith. And I think I had one more page in here so that you could see Oh yeah, I wanted to show you that white gel pen on top of paint. The pink, this pink page is just paint slathered down and then I wrote in the gel pen over top of it and the stamp was collaged. But you can see that these pages are great for, they accept all sorts of writing, scribbling, painting, glue, and all sorts of other elements can be added to these pretty easily. So that's that's my rah 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 for the notebooks for composition notebooks. The other books that I love, and I have a huge variety of them, are these books that are made for specifically for sketching. Typically, they're going to have blank pages in them. They're going to have bindings. And when you purchase them, they may have um, some sort of identification on the front of them that tells you the weight of the paper or what the paper is specifically designed for. Um, I don't necessarily pay attention to that so much as I do the visual of the book. Um, and, and yeah, I do judge a book by the cover and I buy my wine by its label. But uh, that's who I am. So. Anyway, this is, I think this came from Target, um, and it's just a sketchbook with a glue binding. Uh, you can see that the signatures are glued in there. Um, I'm not super thrilled with the paper. It's really, really thin, like the composition notebook paper is far sturdier than this stuff. But again, it, it gets rid of the preciousness or it eliminates the preciousness of the book right away and that means I can take more risks in it. This is a type of book. I love these journals. Um, they come in two sizes. Um, let me get them on the screen here. This is a smaller one. I want to say this is maybe five by eight 
And this book is made by a company. Oh, this is a moleskin. I thought it was a ranger. And I'm saying that wrong. I think it's Malay skin, skin or something like that. But we've seen these all over um, stacked at cash registers and um, in bookstores. They are beautifully bound, wonderful, sturdy books. You can see this. Um, this book has been really, truly loved on and filled with all sorts of marks. The cover is tissue paper that's collaged over like a craft, a brown craft paper base. And these books are stitched together. So um, the one thing that I want to tell you to pay attention to when you do choose to um, purchase a book is pay attention to its binding because uh, the nature of its binding is going to control how much abuse the book will actually take. So I thought, I thought that little one was the same brand as this, but it isn't. But this is another book that I really love. Um, it's also got a craft board sort of cover. Um, this one is reinforced with some additional cardboard. This is a book that is also has a stitched, a stitched binding, which let me see. you can sort of see there. It, it's stitched and glued, and the pages are so incredibly beautiful. Um, really, really sturdy. They take all sorts of media and abuse. And I'm just going to show you a couple pages here. Um, this is one black paint, white gel pen. These are flowers that were fresh at one point in time. I just pressed them with some wax paper and then taped them down with decorative tape. And um, I think this is collage. It doesn't feel like it's the tape. These are some of the things that I'm going to be sharing, some of these processes I will be sharing during our time together. But if you have questions, feel free to ask about the, the construction of a particular page. Um, another thing that I talk a lot about is, is working on a page in stages. Like you don't necessarily sit down and start and end something in one session. A page can evolve over the years. And this is a series that did. There's some watercolor on here some um, glitter glue, bits of collage, some words that I lettered on some paper and collaged on. This is a page that I actually added into the book and um, it, it's from The Little Prince and I turned this back side of the page into um, some found poetry. We'll have to do fun poetry because I love that exercise. Here's another um, page that's built with watercolor and pencil where I'm just drawing um, the same object from different angles. And each time I draw it, I put a new layer of watercolor on. That's something else I'll probably share with you guys. Um, here is another one of those Ranger books. This one happens to still have the book band on it. The book band or rubber band broke off of the other one. Um, but this helps keep the book from flying open when you're transporting it. And the other nice feature of these books is that inside the cover, they have a great envelope. And I tend to glue an envelope into my books if I don't have one. I think I just emptied it. Oh, no, there's still some goodies in here. But whenever I come across collage material, these are some old, um, old Monopoly cards, I will tuck it into an envelope inside my journal, and then I just have it to play with later on. So you can always add those envelopes down the road. Um, the other sorts of books that I really like are handmade books. And Handmade books are really easy, and I'm going to show you how to make one at the end of this video. How are we on time? Oh, good. So, handmade books, I make mine out of old drawings or bits of paper that I maybe started a painting out on and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and didn't finish or got distracted or whatever. Um, and really, all a book is... It's made up of signatures. This is a signature here. And it's just basically pieces of paper 
that are stacked together, folded in the middle, and then stitched together along the binding. So with that in mind, when you break a book down so that it's just a bunch of flat pieces of paper stacked together, folded, and stitched, you can do that with anything. I've done it with junk mail. Seriously, you can do it with anything. So this is a journal that I made. You can see my stitching with, uh, what is this, but baker's twine, butcher's twine. Um, and these are literally drawings that, or, or, or paintings or scrap pieces of paper from other projects that I, I put together for, for this book. Um, and again, I will show you how to do that at the end of this video. But I want to show you some other books that I have um, worked in. This is a handmade book. Um, this is a journal made by Mary Sanders Lazenby. And Mary, I'm sorry if I don't say your name right. Um, Blue Goose Studios. I took a workshop and she was a student in the workshop and I absolutely loved her books and splurged a couple years ago and bought this one for myself. So as best as I can tell, the cover is a couple layers of fabric that have been collaged and painted and doodled on. And then um, you can see there's four signatures in this book. They're really high quality artist paper that has a lovely, beautiful stitching on the backside. Um, something about working in a handmade book, it does become, in a handmade book of this quality, it becomes a bit more precious and scary, um, but the experience can be so incredibly rewarding um, because it's, it's just a matter of, of working in something that's finely crafted. So this is a page that is just all collage. The tissue paper is collaged, the flowers are collaged, these bits of scrap paper with text are collaged, and then I just markered the words on. This is a page where I was just playing different th with different things. Uh, this is a print that I pulled off of a jelly plate that had leftover paint on it. These were some watercolor techniques I was trying out. And then I just mixed up a bunch of um, paint swatch colors one day and plastered them down over top of something I wasn't really pleased with. So look, you can see the stitching in the pages. It's just this book is just a, such a pleasure to work in. And then I have this book here, which is also a handmade book. Um, it's a handmade book, but it's an altered book. This was uh, some sort of Christmas book from the thrift store, and I created this book in a workshop that I took with Ingrid Jikers, uh, where she had us deconstruct the book. We took it completely apart and then we rebuilt it with our own pages and we collaged over top of the cover. Let me show you. Sticky note in here so you can't see the the interior spread. Maybe if I put this here you can see it better. And so this is a signature that we have created here. Um, we distressed the pages before we sewed them together. This is my spirit animal book, so um, the pages I'm showing you will have spirit animals on them. The button process was something that Ingrid had in one of her books, and I wanted to teach myself how to do it. It's very difficult because you're stitching the buttons on with floral wire, and I will tell you there was blood involved in some bad words. Um, here is another page where I used a hole punch to create some interest along. Can you see that? along the page edge. Uh, so this book is a lot of collage elements around the perimeter to create a, a lovely frame. And then just some paint. These eggs were all finger painted. So something else that you can do with all the free time we have now, right? So, and then I want to I want to talk about altered books, and I have a couple of altered books here that I want to share. Um, do you guys remember these? 
little golden books. They make awesome journals. So a little bit of sandpaper to the cover, some acrylic paint or craft paint, uh, and you have you have a fabulous little book. This is a book that I work in at Christmas time, um, from a, actually from a workshop I took with Don Sokol, who wrote the 1,000 Pages book. So, um, and I love this little page. I love stitched elements. I love adding stitched elements into my books. This is just a little bit of eyelet lace, um, and it's stitched onto the page. Here you can see with embroidery floss. I love, I love the effect when you close the book up and you have the lace sticking out. So um, this is this is another this is a book that I published myself with uh, a number of my siren paintings. The sirens was a series of figurative works I did a number of years ago, and I published this book specifically as a journal. And then um, went in and it did some fun things like this page. You can kind of see the, the silhouette. The figure, that's the woman from this, just blown up a little bit larger, and she has another image woven, literally woven into the page. Um, and, and I wanted to show you this because I think this is going to be one of our lessons with some decorative lettering using a phrase or a line of poetry that you really love and some stitched embellishment. And then this book, this is a big, this is a big book. I don't even know. It's got to be 16 inches tall. My neighbor gave this to me um, when she was cleaning her attic out. She found it, or maybe it came from her grandmother's house, but she thought I might enjoy it. And I love it because I have used it as my own, my own study of painting. This is text from the original, original title page. And as I work with different artists, take workshops with them, I transfer my class notes and do one of their exercises in this book um, so that it is one master storage place of all the things that I have been lucky enough to learn over the years. I'm trying to find, find another page that I can show you. I thought I had it marked. Oh, here. So this is um, a, an artist whose work I study. And um, this is from a workshop that I took with Lynn Whipple. She's all about moving your hands. This is for a class I'm currently taking um, or my studies that are currently ongoing with Stock Cordic. Uh, that would be my Ingrid page. I mentioned her to you before because I've taken bookmaking classes with her. And the, the book is, continues. It's an art history book. I just simply paint over the sections of the pages that I don't want to keep and add my own information to it. So it becomes a personal world of art. So I've showed you a lot of different books, but you can also journal on loose pages. Um, oh, look what I found yesterday. This is a board book. Obviously, it's a rabbit shape. It's Peter, Peter Rabbit. Um, it's super shiny, so I'm going to have to sandpaper the pages. But I am on such a bunny kick lately with my paintings. And when I saw this, I was like, I have to have this. So anyway, um, repurposing books. You can pull one off your shelf. You can go to a thrift store. Please don't, not endorsing anybody, go anywhere right now or buy anything. Um, but you can, you can get books from anywhere. Try a little library if you have any of those little libraries. Or even post something on Facebook in your neighborhood chat room and see if somebody has a shelf of old books. Um, there's some people in our community who are putting their books in a box on their porch with their name in it since our library has closed right now. Um, and they just ask that you return the book when you're done with it. So um, 
you know, I think there's lots of ways that we can find uh, a book to use without necessarily having to go out and purchase something. Um, and with that in mind, you can also work, you can journal on loose paper. I have seen file folder journals, I have seen binder journals, um, I have seen just loose bits of papers. I have students who come and work. Oh, I touched my face. I have students who come um, to my monthly journaling classes and they work on loose paper and it's fabulous. Um, because really, it's not about having the book, it's about having the process of sitting down and, and making the, the work and giving yourself that mental escape. So, um, and I just wanted to share that, you know, just because you're working on a loose paper doesn't mean your loose paper has to be square, rectangular, or book shaped. Um, this was one of our favorite uh, journaling workshops that I did with my group uh, a couple of years ago, where, where um, we used historic statues of women, whether it was the, the woman of Willendorf, we used Venus de Milo, I think we had another stencil as well, and we created paper dolls, selfies as paper dolls, um, using um, regular paper, I think this one was actually an old painting on the back, uh, and, and a number of different exercises, and then we laminated them with packing tape so that we could use them as bookmarks and they could be um, a lot sturdier. So, you know, don't think about the, just because art journaling happens to primarily take place inside a book, I don't want you to think that as you begin to structure your art journaling practice, it has to happen in a book because um, there's so many other, other ways that we can be creative and uh, do the same thing. So um, I'm going to demo how to make a book real quickly. And then I'm going to take an opportunity to scroll through and oh, touching my face again to scroll through and try to answer any questions that you might have there have uh, posted to the to the feed. So if you have any questions, feel free to start typing them out and I will get to them in a minute. So I showed you earlier this book that I said was literally a stack, let me find the middle of it, literally a stack of drawings or discarded papers in my studio that I stitched together. And this morning I went through my studio and I found a number of loose loose bits of paper um, so that I could I could walk you through this process so what you want to do is you want to find paper that you're going to bind together I'm horizontally surface challenged right now and you're going to start out by by stacking them so you're going to stack them and you kind of want you want them to align or have a central axis that they're going to align on. They don't have to all be the same size, like perimeter size. They can be staggered or different, different sizes. For instance, the cover here, you can see, is a good inch shorter than some of the pages on the inside. And then if I open up, some of my inside pages are also a little bit smaller than um, here's another example they're they're not all the same size but you do want to have a shared central axis because that's where you're going to stitch uh, your seam with so you're going to take each piece separately and fold it in half and then you want to get a really tight crease so you're going to fold each piece separately in half and you're going to crease it really tight. I said do each piece separately. You don't want to take the whole group and fold them because what happens is that pages move and slide and then you're not going to get a nice neat sandwich of uh, folded sheets. You want your page really snug in nice and tight against each other. So it's important that this crease is really, really tight. And then when that happens, you're going to nest 
all of your pieces in together. And you probably can't tell, but I'm using a good amount of pressure here just to make sure that there's no there's no space that this that this apex where all the pages join is nice nice and tight and then what I like to do is open my book how many degrees would you say that is maybe 30 40 degrees I have my pages all nice and snugged in tight and I'm going to open it 30 or 40 degrees and I'm going to use a binder clip or a paper clip and I'm going to snap these pages together. And I'm going to show you that with this one. So you see how I've, I've got my apex ah, nice and snug right here. All my pages are tucked in together and I have a binder clip. I have four binder clips. I have two on the top that hold my pages together and I have two on the bottom although technically who knows if it's the top or the bottom yet but anyway the top and the bottom I have these pages all snug together then what you want to do is find find a space that you can while retaining this sort of partially open angle um, you want to pop you want to punch a couple of holes sometimes what helps is before you clip them together if you ah, before you clip all of your pages together I've done this so many times that I don't necessarily I skip the step anymore but before you you clip all your pages together mark an even number of spaces along the inside crease of your innermost page. Um, I find that four, four is completely enough. Um, and I'll just mark four little dots along that. If you need to, use a uh, ruler to measure it out, that's fine. Because what you're going to do is then you're, after you have all of your things tucked in or snugged in nice and clipped you will have a mark you'll have marks inside I'm going to open this up a little bit so that you can see where you can now go in and punch holes do you see how I have those four holes down along that middle crease you want to punch those holes so that they go all the way through can you see them on the back side here there's one two, let's see, three, four. So you want those holes to go all the way through. Um, and you do want to pre-punch them. Don't try to stitch um, freeform because it your pages are going to shift and you're going to be really unhappy. Um, when I punch those holes, I use a tool called an awl. You can, uh, these are really sharp, don't run with them. Don't run with them pointing up either, and don't stab yourself in the leg with them. They will make you bleed from personal experience. Um, you can also use an, a nail. There are all sorts of different tools you could probably use, or even. Um, it's just mostly important that you get your hole through all of the layers. And you can use any sort of thread that you wish to stitch with. If we were concerned about our books being archival uh, or following the history of bookmaking, we would choose to use a waxed linen thread. Um, I have used that in the past. It's a lovely thread. It's very easy to stitch with because it is waxed and it's also very sturdy. But for these books that I'm making out of scrap paper, I'm perfectly content to use embroidery floss or um, this, this um, baker's Baker's twine or um, butcher's twine. I love, oh, how about if I hold it on camera? I love the colors. And um, I chose green and white because, hello, St. Patty's. Happy St. Patty's. So I have my needle pre-threaded here. You want to cut a piece of thread that's about uh, at least twice the length of the uh, edge that you are binding. So my, my piece of thread is more than double this length. 
And I'm going to start, I'm going to start from the outside. Again, we have four holes. Oh, look, you can see them really easily. One, two, three, four. And I'm just going to, I'm using a sturdy needle. Um, I think this is an embroidery one. It had to have a big enough eye in it for me to um, thread the twine through it. So I'm going down, starting from the outside of the book, I'm going down, and then I'm coming back up. And do you see how I left this tail? That's important, leave that tail. You don't wanna pull it all the way through. And it takes a little bit of care as you stitch this. Um, And dexterity challenge. Let me stitch this one through. So now I have come from the top to the bottom of my book and what I want to do is I want to create some tension because it's this thread's job to hold all these pages together and I just make sure it's taut. So do you see what I'm doing? I'm just pulling. I'm not, I'm holding onto the thread not the needle. I'm, I'm using the base of my hand to hold onto the thread it nice and taut. So now I'm just going to go down. And then up this other one. And down again. The needle does not want to go through, so I'm going to pull the thread over to the side. And now I'm going to sort of hang my book and I'm going to really, really tug. Now on the inside, let me stand up so I can do this so you can watch. Do you see how I have, this is pretty, pretty tight. There's a good amount of tension here. I'm going to slip this. I might have to open the book up in order to do this. Slip the needle underneath. And I'm going to ah, I'm gonna slip the needle underneath, but then I'm going to catch it on the other side. So I want to make sure you see this. So the thread is underneath my binding stitch. First it goes under, and then it goes over top of the binding stitch and through that loop. See, what I'm doing is I'm creating a little bit of a slip knot. If I was a sailor, I could probably tell you what this is called. But it's just going to be a little slip knot. And then I'm going to tuck my thread back through after tightening that so that I have my tail on the back side here and my knot fell, came all the way through. So that's all right. My hole was a lot bigger than I anticipated. But what I'm just going to do is I'm going to take my needle off and I will just knot this. I will do a double knot on the end, which is what I just tried to do on the inside, but it slipped through. And double knot it again. And you can trim this tail off if you like, or you can just leave it hang. So the binding is now across the back side across the inside. I'll take the binder clips off and then I'll show you the book that we just made. You can do this with your children's drawings. You can do this with junk mail. You can do this with um, any sort of packaging material that comes all crumpled up and wrapped around your purchase. So um, this is some sort of watercolor paper that I started painting on. This is newsprint. This is a piece of palette paper. Looks like this. these were sketches done in a workshop. Some more palette paper. Watercolor paper. 
and then it just sort of repeats. Oh, look. A demo from Blue. So one of the beautiful things about making a book this way is that the pages already have marks on them. So it's not super precious, um, but it also creates a little bit more excitement when you sit down to actually uh, work in it because you have marks on the page already that you can respond to. So I hope I haven't bored you all to tears because clearly I can talk about books for forever. Um, but what I'm going to do right now, let me see if I can go over here. And nope, I'm going to have to do it on my laptop. I'm going to try to scroll through this and answer any questions that you guys might have. Oh boy, you guys are busy, busy, busy. Let's see. I don't know how I can tell. I am clearly learning as I go here. So um, bear with me, please, in a live feed with, with this many people in the past. So. miss your question I'm gonna go back to you um, I'll follow the feed I'll check in a couple of times during the day today and make sure that I'm reading everything and responding to everything so I'm excited I see a lot of really wonderful lots of new people do and familiar people so much thank you so much to me this is a Michelle asked, is that the one with the horse? Uh, I believe Michelle's talking about my big, the big book that I shared and um, my personal art history altered book. And yes, that's the one with the blue horse um, that you love so much, Michelle. Um, and that was from a lesson that I did with Leslie Humphreys, who is an amazing equine painter. Um, you can go her and uh, find her work online incredibly talented and she actually has a solo show right now at the Pearl Museum in Spring Texas so if you happen to be in that area although the museum may not be open but um, maybe old cookbooks yes Deborah says old cookbooks um, they are fabulous for journals uh, yes absolutely and and going back in if you go to repurpose an old book and you feel or you find that the surface of the page is really glossy or shiny one way to combat that or get around that is to take some sandpaper to it and that will break down the coating that's on the page uh, another option is to just use acrylic paint over top of it or gesso of some sort and that will give you the tooth that you need gesso will give you more of a tooth than an acrylic paint might um, you can go in and make some more marks there. Laura, you are so, so, so glad that you're here. Let's see, what do I punch with? Okay, Robin, great, great question. I'll show it again. I, oh, wait, are you, you're not talking about the book binding. You're talking about the actual, well, we'll take it both ways. So the page that I showed you that I punched was just made with a regular hole punch. Um, I'm trying to pull it up for you again. I'll give you a close-up. So it was just one of those regular hole punches, but instead of happening to be a circular one, this is kind of a long rectangular one. But you can get these craft punches, all sorts of different uh, orientations and shapes. And, and play with them, even using them over top of each other on things. Um, I was in a workshop where we took a small piece of paper and we chewed around the edges of like a post-it sized piece of paper with a, whole, with a punch of some sort. And what we ended up with was this, these really cool little creatures, um, wonderful little, little shapes. Um, that were very fantastical. I think that was a Carla Sanum class. Um, 
but I loved I loved doing that and I love playing with punches and um, using them in in different ways than they're actually intended for so I bet you you have something around the house that you can play with um, and then if you were asking about what I punched the holes when I bound my book with this is an uh, a tool called an awl and it's got a really very very sharp end on it and it will easily puncture through all sorts of tag board as well as varying weights of paper so good question thanks Robin Denise do do I'm journal to journal the journal project I'm working on do journal and completely use up one well I can tell you what I do Denise but what I do doesn't matter because it's all about what you do. Um, so I have some journals that are specific, like topic specific. I have my spirit animal journal. I have uh, a journal that I use for my demos when I take it to when I take it to teach. I have my personal art history journal that I shared with you earlier. Um, but mostly, I just have a huge variety of books. And when I feel the need to do something, I choose a book that matches the kind of tools that I'm going to be able to use. So, for instance, when my daughter was a competitive dancer and we were going away for the weekends, I would take a composition notebook because it was lightweight and I knew I was going to be journaling with gel pens in that. Uh, later today, I want to dig a little bit more deeply into some things and I have the luxury of working in my studio so I may choose a journal with heavier weight paper that will allow me to paint and draw and get the page really wet sort of thing um, and then it also I think it also hinges on on my feeling and do I want to do a small piece do I want to do a large piece I guess I just kinda let my intuition steer me with respect to that Clearly, I don't start and finish a journal all at once. And I also don't necessarily work from the very beginning of a journal to the very end of it. I jump all over. Um, and I don't always start on a clean page. I will go back to another page and, and make marks over top of that. So it, it's a lot of hopscotching, but um, it works for me. If you need something to be more organized then you should structure your practice accordingly um, journaling is a really personal practice and you know remember what I said there's no rules give yourself permission to play and to explore and to express yourself um, but don't enforce anything that makes you feel uncomfortable or takes any bit of the joy out of it so I hope that's answered your question. Uh, let's see. Michelle wants to know how will you teach your videos? Um, Michelle, that's a great question. And, and that's something that Ardith and I have talked about. We're not really certain that we, well, we know that we don't understand the technology right now that would help us to do that, but it's something that we are to be able to do so that we can um, maybe split a screen and come to you live um, from each of our locations. For those of you who don't know, I'm in Michigan and Ardith is in Alabama. So um, it's not so easy as one coming to the other's kitchen table and having a cup of tea together. So, But we're, we're thinking about that. And then the other thing that we're pretty sure is going to happen is that as we're creating these videos and and I watched her yesterday and, and she watches me today, there, there's going to be sort of this natural progression that builds off of our content um, and our teaching styles and stuff. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to, to build, build that web, I guess, that network of idea sharing and, and uh, bringing journaling to you guys. Linda, the universe is telling you to make a book, then you need to go home, girl. Let's see. When is the next video? Uh, okay, I'm glad you brought that up. So later today, I'm going to send a newsletter out to everybody. It's going to include a comprehensive breakdown 
of what's happening. Um, Ardeth and I have, have um, put this together over the weekend, and there was a lot of scrambling involved as well as family obligations and previous commitments happening. So um, it's kind of, I don't want to say it was piecemeal, but it, we were very much flying by the seat of our pants. We wanted to get this out there and we didn't want to wait until we had the luxury of being able to sit down and plan this sort of adventure like a regular online class would have been mapped out. Um, we wanted to get the content to everybody right away because now we'll need it. So uh, that said, Ardeth and I have each created a page on our websites that is completely dedicated to the Journal Through It uh, project. And on each of our respective web pages, we will be posting our list to our Facebook Live content. Um, basic supply lists, any sort of other information that we feel will help you plan your, your journaling time and, and when to plug in to, um, to our feeds. So I am hoping the feeds will be around 10 a.m. on my days. And Ardeth has got, a, she's got a couple of, uh, she's going to be consistent times, but they're, they're specific to her day. So like on Monday, she's always going to be at I think too central. Um, sometimes the, these may shift and we ask you to be with us as we um, marry this project with all of the obligations and responsibilities that we, we have going on. But uh, we really, we are committed to getting this information to you. So uh, the schedule will be on our sites and the live feeds will come either from this page of mine when I'm hosting or from her page, Ardeth Goodwin, when she's hosting. And if you do not already get my newsletter, there is a link. I will include a link. I'll pin it to the top of my Facebook page after this video. Um, so you can go to Curly Santini on Facebook and sign up for the newsletter there. Uh, and Ardeth has information on how to sign up for her newsletter as well, but I'll make sure that I include that in what I send out today so that everybody is equally informed. So um, the next video is tomorrow at some point. I just don't know when it is. It's Ardeth's. Um, Ardeth is going to do a lesson. I'm so excited for it. Um, but I'm sorry, Michelle, I don't know the time off the top of my head. Kathy wants to know if I ever consider a book done. Nope. They, they all work some process. Um, so I never, never consider them done. Um, but I think that's also me because I don't always consider paintings completely done either. If I look at a painting a year down the road, uh, I may see things that I want to change. So that just could be how I'm wired, Kathy. Glinda, how do you find your spirit animal? That's a really good question. Um, I'm not an expert on them, but I will tell you that I consider my spirit animals to be animals that show up in my life repeatedly. Um, some people might call that synchronicity as well, but maybe I'm dreaming. I had a dream where there was like a polar bear in it randomly, and then I happened to walk into my, my counselor's office and she's got a polar bear statue on her bookshelf. Or um, I just, I, I randomly come across a polar bear in some unexpected way. Um, so I just try to pay attention to them. Uh, right now, rabbits are huge in their feature, featuring or showing up in my paintings. They're showing up uh, in in freaky other ways in my life and I'm just paying attention to them and I don't necessarily try to break down what it what it means so much as welcome them in and listen and then later on I can figure out what it is they're trying to tell me so I think it's just a matter of paying attention and I would love to know who your spirit animal is once you've been watching out is there there uh, I will note that. Maybe that's something that we can do. That would be a lot of fun. Will each video have a demo, Pegret? Um, I think some of mine will. 
lots of times it's more about teaching a concept and not necessarily a process. So it, it, I think the videos are going to be married best to the material. Um, but let, let me know if you really want demo stuff. Um, and my experience with demos is that they're great for teaching somebody how to use a material. But me personally, I would much rather teach a concept and then allow uh, the student to run with it and interpret it in their own way. Sometimes I feel like demoing a concept can be really stifling because I know when I see a concept demo, then I want to replicate exactly what that what that teacher just did. So um, I want to, I, for me as a teacher, it's the most fulfilling to see students take the same idea and interpret. 3,000 different ways. Um, so that's kind of how I approach my teaching style as well. But if you feel that you need more demos or you have questions during a video and I haven't demonstrated enough of it, please speak up and let me know because I will absolutely offer that for you. Ah. <laughs> Michelle, should we pay you with toilet paper? Check in with me in a week and I'll let you know how we did. Thank you. <laughs> Um, what kind of journals do you use, brand, etc., your tools? Not all today necessarily. Michelle, I talked about a lot of that at the very beginning of the video. I'm not really sure if you were uh, plugged in or tuned in at that point, but if you watched the beginning of the video, I spent a lot of time talking about the materials that I use and what's in my um, journal, uh, journaling supply kit and showing some of my books and things. So uh, there, I also have a supplies list on my web page that is dedicated to journal. And as, as the lessons evolve, I will be sharing some of my favorites, but then also mentioning alternative tools and materials that you can use as well. So um, yeah, thank, thank you for asking. And I think that's all. So no, nope, Michelle, don't apologize. It's a great question, and I'm glad you asked it. And then uh, anybody else who just tuned in knows is back there. Utah, hi. I'm sorry that you missed it, but we'll be archived. So you can watch in a little bit when I sign off. You can go back to the beginning. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's it. I can't believe that I've talked for an hour and that my household was quiet that long and we didn't get a cat walking across screen. Um, thank you for sharing your morning with me. Thank you for sharing your morning with Ardith. Thank you for being open-minded and wanting to bring some journaling into your world, whether you are new to the practice or looking to refine or expand or looking for an excuse to dive into your own journaling work a little more deeply. I'm really happy you're here. Uh, Together, we're going to work our way through this. We're going to journal our way through this. Uh, the world's a really scary place. And that's okay. Fear is not an easy thing to sit in, uh, but it's not, it's not the be-all, end-all. So um, we have our voice, we have our creativity, we have each other. Let's, let's lean on that. Um, everybody, please stay, stay healthy. Stay safe. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting to say something. Of course, it'll come back to me. Um, I will be back here on Wednesday. Today, no, today is, today is Tuesday. I will be back here on Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Ardith is in Central Time Zone, uh, and she will be here tomorrow. I, I will, um... I think I might be able to edit the comment or the description on my post to include when her time is since I did such a poor job of preparing myself in that capacity. But um, let me know what your questions are. Feel free to share this video with anybody who might enjoy it, um, the project, and um, let's journal together. So thanks. I'm really, really happy to be able to do this. and. Um, Thank you. You guys are giving a lot to me as well. So take care. Have a great day. Bye.
looking for the end button. That's how tech savvy I am.